Well, I got to tell you that that was a fun way to meet uh, Ed and Linda, and um, I. But I will say that the way I feel before this morning is that I, I I'm going to apologize in advance because I think I'm about to get your goat. And by that, what I mean is I'm about to assault you <laughs> with information and with uh, truth from Scripture, and I hope you guys are ready. Uh, this morning to be students. And that's what I would encourage you to do uh, even beyond today is become students, become note takers, become studiers. And uh, what you're going to hear today from all the different speakers are, um, it's not redundancy, it's repetition. And and uh, repetition, as they say, is the mother of all learning, right? You're going to hear different scriptures touched on and uh, different things uh, taught today that will seem like we're repeating one another, but really we're just driving the point home. And these are these are things that I'm excited, uh, hopefully, that you guys will pick up today. I'm, I have a lot to cover in our time together today, so uh, I'm going to take off the starting blocks quite quickly here. And uh, it's going to feel at times, probably with me and with others, like you're drinking from a fire hydrant throughout the course of the day. And that's why I suggest you take notes um, and, and also um, make good on all of these resources out there. Become a student beyond today and, and outside of these sessions, go buy books and, and materials that they've made available so that you can become a student at home as well. Um, I've personally always been fascinated uh, by both creation and God's word and eschatology, the, the, the study of end times. And and I'm very, very humbled to be able to have this opportunity to speak today. I'm, I am a, um, I have no degrees behind my name. I'm, a, I am a, a simple man who knows how to read. And so, if I can learn things, that should be an encouragement, encouragement to some of you that you can learn things as well. Okay. Uh, of course, I'm very honored of, of these uh, to be uh, here with these these men who have spent so many years and. Uh, serving God and studying God's word. So um, today we're going to, we, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, it's the study of protology, which is the study of, of uh, the beginning of creation, and then eschatology, which is the study of end times and uh, the consummation, the, the culmination of all things. And the fact that these two subjects are attacked from outside of the church is is a given, right? Uh, a Romans 1 culture is going to do that. That's to be expected. Um, but the real tragedy is that these days, um, the most ardent attacks are coming often from those within the body of Christ. And it's questioning, it's twisting, it's speculating. The new buzzword is deconstructing, right? Um, uh, teaching you how to deconstruct uh, all of this spiritual abuse that that you've been subjected to your whole uh, childhood in Sunday school and all of that. Um, to the point, though, that the truth is so watered down and difficult to understand that most folks just avoid these subjects altogether, uh, afraid of the controversy that may arise if they bring it up around the dinner table or even in the context of a local church. Okay, But understanding the basics of both the beginning and the end and the narrative in Scripture is not that difficult because scripture tells a linear story and what you believe about the beginning and the end will have a major effect on your beliefs and how you live your life. I believe that if you read the Bible from cover to cover using a proper interpretive approach you will find that throughout the whole of scripture from beginning to end there is a stage upon which the story unfolds. There's a seen existence, a physical reality as well as an unseen existence, a spiritual reality. From beginning to end, there's a main cast of characters that reside in this created physical realm and as well as the created spiritual realm. And these characters, this cast of characters, you see all the way through to the end of uh, uh, Revelation. There are various created physical beings and there are various created spiritual beings. Also, from beginning to end, we see the plot unfold. Uh, we see the innocence of the beginning. We see the tragic fall of both created physical and spiritual beings into corruption. We see the solution presented and fulfilled in the person of Jesus. 
We see the climactic victory over the enemy, and we see the final victorious restoration as well, the happily ever after at the end of the story. And some people state it like this, creation, corruption, redemption, restoration. And of course, we're in a period of redemption right now. Christ has redeemed, but yet that restoration period, that hope of glory is still hanging out there in the future. And that is our hope. That is what we look forward to. But here's what we must remember. The the whole story, the entire plan of God from eternity to eternity is unfolding exactly the way he has intended that it would. And it will proceed exactly as he has declared that it would all the way back in eternity past. And this is why we have prophecy in the first place. It, it actually is one of the main attributes that sets Christianity apart from any other form of religion in the world is that we know what will happen before it happens because God told us so. From beyond time, he has declared it to be. So I want to remind you, and I'm going to, again, uh, we're going to talk about Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 10. It says, remember the former things long past, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. Verse 10, especially, I want you to take note of, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things which have not yet been done. In other words, he told us from the beginning how things were going to end. He says, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So the father's not flying by the seat of his pants. His ultimate purpose does not change as time goes on. God's not figuring it out as he goes, if you will. This is his plan A, and there is no plan B. Amen? From the beginning, he has established how it all will end in such a way that brings him the most glory, all the glory, and it will bring him pleasure, good pleasure. And it's unfolding according to his eternal purpose. The end of time is going to be a renovation, a return to what life was like at the beginning of time. And the reality at the beginning declares what the reality will be like at the end, only better, even better, okay? And again, the same prophetic story runs throughout all of Scripture from beginning to end. His purpose is what drives the story. I I cannot uh, say this enough. It is God's purpose that drives the story throughout Scripture and all of human history. And here's a hint. What you believe about the beginning and the end should never be detached from His stated purpose in Scripture, okay? We can get so hyper-focused on one area of theology and actually forget that his purpose is the driving force of his plan, all right? And we simply need to commit to the biblical narrative spoken clearly and succinctly in the pages of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end. The plan of God, driven by the purpose of God, revealed in the entire counsel of God, the whole word of God. And we can know and understand it isn't hard or confusing if we will just put the time into studying, rightly dividing the word of truth. We will see that the beginning declares what the end will be like. The Old Testament declares this beginning to end narrative. Jesus also spoke of this beginning to end narrative. The apostles also believed and taught the beginning to end narrative. And then, of course, we will see later that many, many of the church fathers in early church history believed and taught this same narrative. So today we're going to look at this overarching story, God's purpose and plan from Genesis to Revelation. So I have no small task of fitting the whole Bible into this, uh, this, this short period of time I have with you today. Uh, my message today is entitled, As It Was in the Beginning, it shall be in the end, and then I've added only better at the end of it, okay? Because we know that's what Scripture teaches. First, the reality of life or existence in Eden tells us the direction that all things are heading as we approach the end. So we can start with a general knowledge and lay a foundation upon which to build our theology. We can forget that Adam was created into a very different reality than the world we know today. All right, this is huge for the body of Christ today. We think it's always been this way, 
I think about the, the man who was born during that 400 year period between the Testaments when he didn't see any of the miracles or any of the, the stuff that happened in the Old Testament and he has yet to, to see you know, Christ and the apostles and he's just born and lives 100 years and dies in, in that intertestamental period and he thinks life is all about his experience during that time. We can't fall into that trap and believe that just because this is our existence today that there wasn't a time in which God destroyed the earth with water or that there was a time before that was innocent, we need to believe God's word. We just need to believe the Bible and know that the end will again consummate in a way that is supernatural and it will unfold exactly the way God has said that it would. So there have been several changes to human existence and there will be again changes in the future as well. As far as the characters, uh, make no mistake that the main character is God. The main character of the Bible is God. The main character in uh, the church is God. The, the main character of your life is not you. It should be God if you're a believer. You die to self and you live as a living sacrifice. You submit yourself to the truth of God's word and his service. Okay? So God appears in the Bible's first sentence as does the stage upon which God's entire work will unfold from eternity past to eternity future. And it helps to see it set up, for me anyway, like a theatrical play, at least to break it down in that manner. The stage is set, and then the cast of characters are introduced. And in Genesis 1-1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the stage, the heavens and the earth. And this is where his story, God's story, unfolds throughout time and across the pages of Scripture. There are two dimensions on the same timeline, events playing out together on the same stage, the heavens and the earth, the seen and the unseen, the spiritual and the physical, and one is not merely a shadow or representation of the other. The two are separate dimensions of the same created reality. He created the heavens and all of the beings that reside in that spiritual heavenly reality. And there are numerous, I believe. And then he created the earth and all the beings that reside in this physical reality. And there are many, a myriad of beings that, that are created beings that reside within this earth and the physical realm. In Colossians uh, chapter 1 verse 16, Colossians 1 16, it says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens... And on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. So the narrative describes how God created a place where the two dimensions, the physical and the spiritual, would collide. Okay, And in each dimension, there, were, uh, there was a pecking order. There were thrones, dominions, authorities, rulers, and, and it was an almost perfect place in the beginning where heaven overlapped on the earth, if you will. It was a high mountain, uh, as, as Tim mentioned earlier, a place called Eden. And surrounding Eden was a beautiful garden. Well, you ask, how do you know that it was a mountain? Well, a very simple question that I return, well, which way does water flow? Water flows downhill, okay? Uh, the Bible says there was a spring in the garden, and then out of the garden flowed four rivers, Genesis 2.10. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. So water flowed from Eden and split into four separate rivers. In Ezekiel 28, God's word says that Eden refers to it as the holy mountain of God. And by the way, mountains are also where God often chose to speak to man and some of the most significant events in human history took place on mountains. I love the mountains. Uh, in addition to Eden, to name a few, it was where the uh, uh, Noah's Ark rested, where Abraham went to offer Isaac, Mount Sinai, where the law was given, Mount Carmel in the contest of gods, where the temple was built, where Jesus was taken and tempted by the Satan. Uh, and what was he tempted with? Think about this for a moment. He tempted Christ to accept world domination without having to go to the cross, all right? 
And it was where the Sermon on the Mount was preached. It was where the transfiguration took place, where Christ was crucified, where Jesus ascended to the Father, where Jesus will set his foot upon his return. And then, of course, Christ will reign from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem during his millennial reign. And in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no temple. It says that God will be the temple but Revelation says that new Jer- the new Jerusalem will descend and that he was taken up on a great and high mountain uh, to view this. So Eden, this high mountain was the place, but who are the main characters then that we see at the beginning of the, the story? Because we can mistakenly believe that there were only two characters, that there were humans and there was God, but there's actually more characters than that. As I mentioned before, there were spiritual beings that God created, the host of heaven, those who reside in an unseen existence, the invisible, angels, archangels, seraphim and cherubim. Uh, not all are angels. We can, we can think that they're all angels, but there are different uh, rulers and principalities and powers that were set up uh, an organization in that uh, reality as well, just like there was on earth, okay? Um, in Hebrew, these beings have their own category title, often referred to as Elohim, and it's often translated as stars, sons of God, princes, holy ones. Uh, you, you see the divine council referred to. Most references uh, are obscure, and there's probably very good reason for that because uh, people want to worship things all the time, okay? And if we had too much information in Scripture about these, these beings, then I'm certain that we would find a way to worship them, all right? But um, we can have a basic understanding of these beings and their purpose. They were servants of God sent to do His bidding in the heavens and on the earth. And I have put up references there. Uh, I, I certainly can't dig into all of that today, but you can make some notes. And if you miss the notes, I will send you my notes and, and make it a, a point of study yourself. So while we do not have a ton of information, and likely for good reason, as I said, these beings reflected God's image, His glory in the spirit realm. They are described as residing in the heavenlies, in the skies, in the heights of the clouds, on the mount of congregation. And in the same way God shared His rule with Adam on earth, He also shared His rule in a way with these created order in the spiritual realm. So in Psalm 82 verse 1, it says God takes His stand in His own congregation. This uh, translated as divine counsel. He judges in the midst of the gods. Well, we know there's only one God, but it uses this word Elohim, these spirit beings, okay? He judges in the midst of the Elohim, these, these created spiritual beings. And one main character that has to be mentioned that's a character throughout the whole of Scripture is found in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 13. Uh, it says, you had the seal of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, described as both. Uh, this, is, this is, of course, we're talking about uh, the Satan, okay? He was described at times as both a cherub, which is not a baby angel, okay? If you're lo- thinking of that little heart playing baby angel, that's not a cherub, Okay, uh, and, a, and then, of course, he was described as a seraph, which just means snake, okay, or serpent. But it tells of this being that had precious stones set in sockets of gold. In Hebrew, his description is Hillel, which means light bearer. And these stones covering him in, in these sockets of gold, we can only assume, was to reflect the glory of God in the place that he resided in the heavenlies. But in Ezekiel 28... 14, it tells us his position. It says, you were the anointed cherub who covers, okay? Uh, The purpose of the light bearer, again, was to reflect the light, the image, and the glory of God and to point to him only. And of course, we know how that story unfolded. Um, In scripture, this is very interesting to note that, that he is never actually given a proper name. Even the name Lucifer that we so often attribute was made up by Jerome when he translated uh, the uh, Hebrew into the Latin Vulgate, okay? And so he just made that name up based on the, the term the light bearer, okay? And um, so God created and appointed, in addition to the spiritual beings, he created and appointed another type of creature, and of course that's 
uh, humanity, the, the earth dwellers. In Hebrew, they're called Adam, which sounds a lot like the Hebrew word for land. And, and of course, we know that's how Adam was created, of the dust of the ground. So there were unseen spiritual beings above, and there were earth dwellers below. And the Bible indicates that in Eden, that the two could see one another and communicate um, this is somewhat of, of, of an assumption here, but we see in Genesis that Eve spoke with the serpent in the garden. She wasn't afraid, as we so often see in Scripture when a human sees an angelic being or uh, they fall down or they try to worship them. Eve, we don't have any, um, I guess, um, indication that, that Eve was afraid or was uncomfortable with this being. But this brings up a truly amazing part of God's plan for humanity. Mankind was given the opportunity to share in God's glory as his partners, as Imago Dei. They were made in his image. And God gave the first Adam, this is important, God gave the first Adam dominion or authority over the whole earth. That's found in Genesis 1, 26 through 27. And God commissioned him to spread the goodness and peace of Eden over the entire planet when he commanded him, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue the earth, okay? And God would rule through Adam, God's appointed man of the dust. And there's a, a fancy term, it's called a theocratic administrator, a theocratic administrator. It's God's man, okay, ruling in peace and prosperity to spread the the, the peace and communion with God over the entire planet, over all created things. And uh, I like to refer to this as the gospel of Eden. Uh, it's it's that, that whole spread, the, the way we spread the gospel of grace. He was to, to be fruitful and multiply over the whole earth. And there were similar commands throughout scripture that God gave men uh, who were his representatives. Uh, just a quick review uh, before we move on. So the stage, all creation, physical and spiritual, Heaven and earth overlapping, operating as one in this high mountain garden, the Garden of Eden. The cast were the spiritual beings and earthly beings cohabitating where heavens, the heavens and the earth overlapped. And the plot is God's creature having uh, creatures having full access and communion with Him, interacting with Him and with one another as they enjoyed His creation in all, and all of this was for His glory. And for his pleasure. Now, this narrative never changes in scripture, okay? This was God's original designed purpose for all creation from beginning to end, and the purpose does not change at any time throughout all of history. The scriptural narrative quickly turns to the earth right after its, uh, that first verse. In the beginnings, God created, created the heavens and the earth, and the earth, it turns its attention to the earth, okay? So let's clarify quickly what life was like on the uh, earth in the physical dimension before the fall. Scripture tells us about this, and it's really important to understand. There was perfect harmony between man and creature. And there was perfect harmony between all created earthly creatures as well. Man and all animals were vegetarians at this time. All right? I know that's a bummer for some of you, but that's the way it was. There were no predators or prey before sin, the wolf coexisted with the lamb, in other words. And here's the reality. Creation was good, but it was not yet glory. It was not perfected. It was pristine and pure with God's given authority and order. But, and it, was, it, was, it had tons of potential. It was to be expansive. It was to grow, okay? It had endless potential. Um, it was completely good. But here's the problem. It was not completely secure, and that was uh, according to God's plan. It was still vulnerable to evil and deception and rebellion and arrogance and, and all of that. As we see, that's where the plot thickens. When all creation is fractured by a twin rebellion of both the spiritual and physical beings. And here's the deal. God was not surprised by this rebellion. And while he did not initiate sin or the fall as to be complicit in the origin of evil he is perfectly just 
and perfectly righteous, and we can trust him in the midst of even the fall, the things that even cause us to question what in the world is going on and why does God not intervene. You just need to trust that he is righteous and he is perfectly just, and he will have his day. Amen? God's highest created authority, the spiritual dimension, and God's highest created authority that he created in the physical dimension both rebelled against him. The physical and the spiritual ceased to overlap in the garden as mankind was cast out of the garden and God placed a, 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 um, a spiritual being with a flaming sword at the, the gate of the garden so man could no longer go through, okay? And there's a beautiful picture in that even as well that if Adam had tried to go back into the garden, it would have meant certain death. Someone, in order to get back into Eden, would have to go through that gate and would have to face death. And of course, we'll find out who that is a little bit later. But we see a new behavior emerge among both the created spiritual and physical beings at this time. They began to consort together in their fallenness without God. Fallen spirits in a vengeful way appealing to man's fallen nature, the flesh. And scripture tells us the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. Mankind, of course, from, uh, from that day forward, always giving in to reacquire the fulfillment of the Garden of Eden, uh, always, though, a twisted, broken version that winds up destroying and driving us further from God. It always results in depravity, sexual sin, corrupting one's soul, we see mankind trying to attain this through war and bloodshed, using one another in various forms of slavery, various forms of addiction, all of that stuff, all points back to the fall, to the original sin, and that trying to attain this paradise once again that's so difficult uh, and impossible to attain without, as Brother Tim mentioned, going through Christ himself, the only way. As I've heard it said often, it's the same old story ever since the world began. However, in Genesis 3, God presents the solution. One day, the God-man, a perfect theocratic administrator, the Messiah, the last Adam, would come and regain all that was lost. But in the meantime, mankind would continue to fail, but God would always continue to be faithful. We see it unfold in the days of Noah. When mankind got so wicked that God had to deter their wickedness by essentially hitting the reset button. And afterward, Noah was instructed once again to be fruitful and multiply, to spread out. But in this new broken world, the animal kingdom would be fearful of man. And man would be instructed to eat meat for the first time that we see in Scripture. And this is more than likely when the beasts became predator and, predator and prey. They, they turned on one another. That's found in Genesis 9, 1 and 2. And also from this point, we see natural disasters become commonplace. So this, this pristine creation built to sustain life, human life, uh, you know, was just broken and messed up at that point. And today, folks, we're dealing, still dealing with the aftermath of, of that flood and, and that, that great tumult that happened within the physical realm. Now, this next point is huge. In Genesis chapter 11, we have new characters that enter into the story, new categories upon which God defines these characters, and, if you will, a new conspiracy introduced, a concerted effort to gain world dominion without the help of God, okay? At Babel, mankind attempts to work together with these fallen, really under the manipulation of these fallen spiritual beings, and they attempt to rebuild Eden, and they build a mountain, a temple where heaven and earth would overlap again, often called a cosmic mountain, and they would try to spread their dominion, but do so in a way that, was, uh, that, that left God completely out of the scenario. So with all mankind speaking as one language and with one mind, this type of att attempt would have continued on and on. And so we see there that God intervened. He said nothing would be impossible for them if they remained in that state. And so he intervened in, chapter, in Genesis 11, 1 through 9. And we see that through Babel, really ancient Babylon is born. 
this, this mindset, this sickness in the, in the human uh, mind and heart. It will be a major personified character as it drives main characters throughout Scripture all the way through to its destruction in Revelation. So from Genesis to Revelation, there is a literal Babylon, and I believe there will be a, a literal Babylon in the future, but we see this mindset of humanism which is, uh, is personified in the, the mindset of, of Babylon. And uh, we see here that it's an unholy alliance between man with other men and manipulated by these fallen spiritual beings. And mankind is perpetually drunk on the pleasures and riches of this world and with an insatiable thirst to take dominion to gain control over the earth. It's, it's kind of a twisted and perverted uh, desire based on that original innocent uh, command that God gave Adam to be fruitful and multiply. It is alive and well today. It's humanism expressed in every facet of life, in government and technology and medicine, you name it. We make great strides in all of these areas we really impress ourselves by going to outer space and doing all of these different things and the advances we've made in medicine. But not one thing can a human do to change the heart and the sinful nature of man. Only God can do that. So we're, we're building a tower still without God. And, and, and all of creation is still, humanity is moving in that direction. Ultimately, we see that when the Antichrist comes, he will achieve world domination, utter domination in the world. Um, one other thing I want to mention here is this idea of building a mountain or this temple, a cosmic temple. There's always been this, um, this overlapping in both um, pagan cultures as well as what God has set forth uh, in Scripture when he wanted to meet with man. So the whole purpose, again, was to recreate Eden where heaven and earth would overlap, and we see again in pagan religions uh, pyramids being built, ziggurats in which to worship, and God also instituted worship in uh, temples reflecting this cosmic design and pointing back to Eden and that original creation, the heavens and the earth, a place where God would meet with mankind. So just consider the design, if, if you study the design of the tabernacle, as Tim mentioned, and the temple, it is, uh, that's a deep study all of its own that we could uh, get into, but I don't have time to do it today. So anyway, in Babel, God intervenes just like he did in Eden. And out of this, out of this act, these two new categories within humanity enters the storyline. First, the nations, and then later we see Israel, okay? So I want you to turn to Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, if you've got your Bibles. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, I want you to see this with your own eyes. Now, of course, depending upon the translation you have, you may see a different word there. But um, in Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9, if you want, you can look on the screen. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of all generations. Ask your father, and he will inform you. Your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High Yahweh allotted the nations, so we're talking about Babel, when God separated the nations, and He set the divisions for the sons of humanity, He fixed the territories of peoples according to the number of the sons of God. And that word there is the Elohim. And then it says, but Yahweh's portion, His people, Jacob or Israel, is His own Allotment. So we see here the birth of the nations and then uh, this, this statement that Israel was God's own possession, that he was their own or they were his own nation. At Babel, we see the beginning of um, Babylon and that, as I said, that sickness. Um, we see God divide the nations and the languages according to the number of those Elohim, those fallen spiritual beings. And we see the effects of that very shortly afterward in that God called Abram out from among those people, out from among the nations to start to begin the nation of Israel because they were worshiping false gods. They were under the manipulation of these fallen spiritual beings, okay? So we also see that uh, in this that God wanted his own people, a people that would be his possession and he would be their God. 
a people who would not so easily turn to the influence and allure of these fallen Elohim, but would instead turn to Yahweh. And by choosing Abraham and through his descendants, a nation would be born through which God promised to restore the earth and bless all the Gentile nations. Now, all you have to do is, if you want to see the, the influence of these fallen beings on the nations and, and even later on Israel, is look at when God was wanting to meet with Moses and, and, uh, on Mount Sinai and hand down the law, what, what were they doing below? They were worshiping idols already. It, it's the same story. There's nothing new under the sun. It is the same sin, sickness, and the same uh, propensity for man to turn to idols, okay? Uh, the promise God made was for their own land, specific borders for Israel, by the way, which have yet to be attained and fulfilled in, to the degree that God first said that they would have specific borders. Israel has never attained that much land yet, which only leads us to believe that is a future fulfillment. Also, the Messiah would come through Abraham's seed, the last Adam. This king of kings, the God-man, would not only regain all that was lost in the Garden of Eden, but it would also fulfill every promise God made to Israel in the Abrahamic covenant. Seed, land, and blessing. It was threefold. Seed, land, and blessing. And then blessing to all nations as Israel would become the leading nation on earth in a future fulfillment. A nation of priests and kings in the lineage of David set apart from all other nations, and Jesus would return as king and would establish an earthly kingdom to rule and reign once again on a mountain on the Temple Mount, and this was known as the gospel of the kingdom. And all, uh, the, all the Jews knew this message uh, when Jesus was walking and ministering on the earth. The earth returning to the way it was in Eden with Jesus on the throne and Israel blessing the nations through him. There will also be those reigning during that time with Christ in their glorified bodies, in their spiritual bodies. So spiritual beings and earthly beings once again cohabitating during that 1,000 year reign. And we see that in Revelation chapter 20 verse 6. It will be heaven and earth once again. Heaven and earth. It began with heaven and earth. It's going to end with a new heaven and a new earth. Now, God has always had a representative in the earth proclaiming the gospel. Always. Some form of gospel. Uh, or, and when I say gospel, it is the way that man can reconcile to God and be right with God. Okay, But it's always been about Christ. They looked uh, forward into the future at uh, the Messiah coming, and we look beh behind as the Messiah who came and, and, and uh, paid for the atonement. Amen? So we look now ahead to the second coming when we know he will come back and he will fulfill all of the promises that he has made throughout Scripture. Um, this, from the beginning, from Eden, this mission has always been to spread the message of the gospel or reconciliation between man and God. Adam had that commission, Abraham, Noah, Moses, the kings, the judges, the prophets. Uh, but in the last days, God's word says that God has spoken through his son, Jesus. And so there we've laid kind of a foundation of what things were like in the beginning. And we can look now at what Jesus taught. So did we see a shift in what Jesus was teaching when he was here in his earthly ministry. So let's begin in Matthew 19, 27 through 28. Matthew 19, 27 through 28. In verse 27, Then Peter responded and said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration... When the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, we know for a fact that every one of those disciples died, most, most of them through martyrdom, okay? Uh, and not one of them do we have historical record of that sat on a throne and judged the twelve tribes of Israel, so either Jesus misled them or Jesus was wrong. And of course, we know it can't be either of those. Amen. 
Um, obviously, there's something more to this regeneration thing that we all need to understand. This word regeneration, is it means a new birth, regeneration, a renewal, a rebirth, or a renovation, specifically a messianic, rest, a messianic restoration, a return to what life was like at some point before. And let us not forget that the apostles also uh, spoke of this as well. In Acts 1, verse 6, Acts 1, 6, it says, So when they had come together, they began asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to whom? To Israel. Is it now you're resurrected, like you, you've already been crucified, you, you conquered death. Is it now that you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So they had this expectation of a regeneration that they had learned about was the future of Israel from the time that they were children and growing up and being taught this. All Israelites knew these future prophecies for Israel, and all of them expected these times to come. And by the way, according to God's promise, he would accomplish this through them, and it was irrevocable. Irrevocable. He would never change his mind. He would never go back on his word. And Paul talks about this in Romans 11. But in Jeremiah 31, 35 through 36, Jeremiah 31 35 through 36, it says, Thus saith the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order, and the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. Okay, so he's laying, kind of laying this out there saying, I put all of these things in order, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the, the waves of the sea. Verse 36, If this fixed order departs from before me, in other words, if the sun stops shining, if the moon falls from the sky, if all the stars cease to exist and the waves stop coming in in the ocean, then, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Did you all understand that? All right. So even though they went through times of rebellion, they were punished. I think this statement, and there are many, many more like this in Scripture, that God will fulfill his promises to Israel, okay? Um, and I think he wants us to understand that as well, that his covenant with the descendants of Abraham will never pass away. It is, a, it is an unending covenant. Now, here are the general bullet points of what these men believed, okay? And, and honestly, you could go back to Deuteronomy 32, and you could see most of this stuff lined out in, in the, the Song of Moses alone. These, these prophecies that they believed. Abraham's descendants awaited for Messiah to come, and at some point Messiah would come. Uh, the question is, would he be cut off or would he be the conqueror, right? Would he be pierced or would he be the king? Of course, in hindsight, and I'll mention some of this stuff in hindsight, we know that it was both. Uh, there were prophetic references to both, and now we know how that's going to be fulfilled. Israel would ultimately reject the Messiah, who comes and they would pierce him. There would be a time that Israel would be cut off from God, okay? Their hearts during this time would be partially hardened, the time of the Gentiles, and they would be scattered and would practically cease to exist. And Deuteronomy says they would be made jealous by those who are not a people, the Gentiles, okay? They're not a chosen people like Israel was. In other words, the Gentiles would become the focus of God's redemptive plan at one point in the future. But God would not reject Israel forever. And again, Paul covers this in Romans 11. First, they would face judgment, the tribulation. In Daniel, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And through that, Israel would repent and be purified. Nations will rise up against Israel and God will come to their defense and destroy these nations that have uh, raised up their hand against Israel. And it says, the one whom they pierced, the one whom they pierced would return. I have no idea what that was, but uh, it woke me up. <laughs> That's in Zechariah 12. Israel would be comforted at that time and then renewed. Messiah would set up his throne to rule over the whole earth, and Israel would be restored as a nation and elevated to a place of world prominence. Nations from all over the world would go to Jerusalem to worship King Jesus, who would uh, reside and rule from uh, Jerusalem. And this is the regeneration. And this is why the disciples were asking Jesus, Lord, is it now, is it at this time 
that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel. So what did Jesus say? He said unto them, paraphrase, no, guys, don't take me so literally. Get it through your thick skulls. I'm done with Israel. You blew it. There will never be a physical kingdom. This is all spiritual. It's all allegory. It's never going to happen. That's not what he said. The resurrected Jesus said, it is not for you to know the periods of time or appointed times which the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, for you, it's not the time and it's not for you to know. But here's what you do need to focus on right now, guys. Verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So the Holy Spirit, in essence, is going to tell you what to say, what to write. And and when you do that, the gospel of grace will be spread all over the world to everyone. So primarily, his commission to them, his command to those disciples at that time is incredible because you hold the fruit of it when you hold the Bible in your hands is that you will be divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the very word of God and that will spread globally. And through, and, and through the mystery revealed, the church is that mystery revealed, uh, we would be fruitful. We would multiply and spread the gospel of grace around the whole earth. Okay, so right now, we are the benefactors of spiritual blessings uh, with the promise of the, the, the physical fulfillment yet in the future, as I said before. So Jesus didn't scold them, and he didn't tell them that they were under the wrong assumption. He said, for now, this is what you're supposed to do. He didn't correct their current beliefs and tell them that the promises of the kingdom of the Old Testament were obsolete. Or that they will only be realized spiritually. That's not what he said. Jesus didn't even clarify that the promises he made to them in the Gospels regarding the the regeneration were not literal. Or that they were never going to happen. And he ascended right after this to sit at the right hand of the Father. So if he was going to correct their theology and their doctrine, this would have been the time for him to do it. Guys, it's not going to happen the way you think it's going to happen. He didn't do that. Okay? Jesus ascended, allowing the disciples to continue believing in and preaching about the regeneration when the kingdom would be restored to Israel literally. Look at Acts 3. We see Peter is preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit, his words becoming the actual words of Holy Scripture. And here is what the Spirit declared through Peter at this time, starting in verse 17, Acts 3, 17. And now, brothers, so he's speaking to Israel. That was his audience. And now, brothers, I know that you've acted in ignorance, just as your rulers also did. But the things which God previously announced by the mouths of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled in this way. He said he would do it, actually, and he did it. Do you understand? That's what he's saying. He's fulfilled this. Verse 19, therefore, repent and return. So, turn back to God so that these Old Testament prophecies can be fulfilled completely. Why? He says, so your sins may be wiped away in order that the times of refreshing may come. So once Israel repents, then the times of refreshing will come. From what? He says, he tells us, from the presence of the Lord, that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive, so he ascended, to sit at the right hand of the Father, and he's going to stay there until Israel repents. And at that time, he says, uh, he will return until the period of the restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouths of all his holy prophets in ancient times. Again and again and again, he's saying, the Holy Spirit declares through Peter that there is a regeneration coming just as Jesus said, just as the Old Testament prophets declared. It is, is going to come about And it's called the time of refreshing. The times of refreshing, a noun, it's a refreshing, a refreshment from um, a recovery of breath or being revived. And Peter says, when Israel specifically repents and returns to the Lord, then Christ, who is now ascended and seated at the right hand of the Father, will return and he will bring this recovery of breath. It's a time of refreshing that's been promised for Israel all the way back in the Old Testament. And it was promised by Jesus himself, and it was promised again and preached and taught about through the the ministry of the apostles. 
This time of refreshing will be the first phase of the restoration of all things. The restoration of all things. Okay, and that is um, apokatastasios. And here is what that means, restoration of all things. It's a restitution, a repaying something that was lost. A reestablishment, establishing something again anew. Restoration, the action of returning something to a former owner or a place of its former condition. Reconstitution, the action of building something up again. Reconstruction or renovation. So to be clear, we see according to Scripture here that Jesus said there will be a regeneration. There will be a times of refreshing. The already resurrected Jesus didn't correct the apostles when they made clear they believed the restoration was still coming. And we can't forget what the Holy Spirit revealed to the apostle John that this was going to take place in the future as well. He gets very specific in Revelation 20 verses 4 through 6. Revelation 20, 4 through 6. He says, Then I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So they taught that after the tribulation, this appointed time of Jacob's trouble that would bring Israel to repentance. When Israel repented, then the times of refreshing would come and things would return to the way they were before. And Jesus said himself to the 12, uh, he said, you're going to sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? And we see the same wording in uh, the Apostle John's uh, chapter 20 of Revelation. So a thousand year period of time in which there are those who had been killed for their faith or who have died in Christ will return to the earth and will take part in a kingdom, an actual government headed by Christ Jesus himself. We see the Apostle Paul mention these things as he describes the current state of humanity and this restoration of the earth and all creation in the future. And uh, we're going to take a break here, so hang on in just a few more minutes as as, uh, I bring this to a close, and we'll take a a short break here. But in Romans 8, 18 through 22, Romans 8, 18 through 22, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy of, to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the, for the eagerly awaiting creation waits for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself, so creation itself, the earth and all things created itself, in hope that the creation will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. CNN calls it global warming. The Bible told us it was coming, that the earth was going to fall apart at the seams. That this... this, uh, like one of those wind-up toys that you wind up and it hops really fast and then slows down. That's what's happening to creation. And we need the, we need, we need the creator to come back and wind it up again. That's exactly what's going to happen. So creation awaits and even groans for this recovery of breath, this renovation when the glorified children of God return in their glorified bodies. Creation itself will be set free from the slavery to corruption. A thousand year reign would be the beginning stages, as I said, of the restoration of all things. A return to that Edenic reality, only better. And I believe that reading the Bible from cover to cover, you see this very thing declared in the prophecy of the Old Testament, in the Gospels. We see it unfold in the literal sense of every prophecy that was made about the coming Messiah. Okay, In the way that Christ came the first time he came. He was born of a virgin. He was born in Bethlehem. He was called out of Egypt. He was a Nazarene. He preached the gospel. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. He was flogged. He was crucified. None of his bones were broken. He was laid in a stranger's tomb. On the third day, he rose again. I could go on and on and on and on about these prophecies that Christ fulfilled literally, okay, perfectly to a T, no allegory, 
no spiritualization, literal fulfillments of prophecy. So let's not complicate things. Just take the word at face value and use a proper, consistent, interpretive approach when you read Scripture, the same one that proved these literal fulfillments of Christ the first time he came. Amen? And we will pick up there in a few moments. We're going to take a break. Is someone supposed to come up right now, Ed? All right, come on.